Hello everybody, welcome to a bonus video from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, getting better. My name is Ben Hansen, thank you for being here. I'm excited for this. I have been waiting, I'd say like seven years to have this discussion. Uh, I'm joined by reporter extraordinaire Jason Schreier. Hello, thanks for having me, Ben. Absolutely. This is, this is going to be fun. Oh, I can't wait. We're joined by Greg Lobanov, game developer of games like Chicory, Wandersong. Welcome, Greg. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm excited to have you here, and I was thinking about... I was thinking about why. I was trying to connect some dots. And I, obviously, great games. And then I was like, you know what? Greg's games, they have so much heart and humanity in them. And I feel like this documentary is just, maybe it's my read, but it's bleeding humanity. And so I'm so excited to hear like your take on this freaking thing. So thank you for being here, sir. Uh, and then we're joined by, by George Cruz Alvarez. Welcome from Pop Agenda. Hello there. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. Yeah, I'm excited uh, to have you. And, uh, yeah, it's nice to see everyone here. Excited to talk about this documentary. Really nerdy, in the weeds, uh, how you make video games documentary that I hope your your listenership finds interesting because it feels weird to talk. Like, I'm excited about this thing, but it's so nerdy and in the weeds about game development. <laughs> That's, you know what, you found the right place if you're worried about being too nerdy. I think this is a good spot for it. But I, I'm curious to have your uh, take here, George, just for what, focusing on PR and marketing and then trying to wrap that type of brain around the drop of this 32 part documentary. Okay, I need to set this up. So in this discussion, we are talking about Psych Odyssey, which is the new documentary from two player productions who are housed within Double Fine. It's all about the development of Psychonauts 2. So we are going to be spoiling the game's development. We're going to be talking about the full development of Psychonauts 2. Maybe some bits and pieces of the story of Psychonauts 2 will come up. Frankly, I'd be surprised because I think a majority of what we want to talk about is just like, what we learned about the game industry from this documentary levels maybe levels levels that's because, a great point that's a great yeah. point um but thank you for watching this we're glad you found us you can always subscribe to minmax's youtube channel and you can unlock the podcast version of this discussion all of our other long-form discussions like our huge game club discussion about like a dragon each and a bunch of other bonus stuff if you go to patreon.com slash minmax with two n's you jump in there that five dollar tier you unlock the podcast version right in your favorite podcast app okay here we go. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> That's you know how to plug a game. <laughs> All right. Okay. Where the hell do we start? Um, I, I think I am surprised that this documentary exists. I think it's an absolute miracle. And I think there's a there's a couple takes I've seen on the internet of just people like being surprised by how surprised we are. Jason, you seem like a good person for just setting up like, why do you think this is so remarkable that this documentary dropped like this? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm I'm curious, George. I want to ask you a bunch of questions. Yeah, because from the PR perspective, this is crazy. So, a couple of thoughts here. I've written a lot about behind the scenes of games and their development, but never, uh, always kind of after the fact, and always hearing from people in retrospect. Here's what's been going on. I mean, occasionally I'll hear from people being like, "Man, this place is a shit show." Like, here's right. what's going on, but it's never to the to the kind of like extent that having cameras in your studio for seven years is able to capture um, what it's like behind the scenes of games development. And um, I think that that the big caveat here is that Two Player Productions, the company behind this documentary, is actually paid by Double Fine. They're Double Fine right. employees. And just by nature, this is not going to be as, as gossipy, as juicy as perhaps uh, a reporter's perspective might be. Um, for example, there are meetings that we see in the documentary that the cameras aren't allowed in, such as where the director is 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 where the staff are told that the director has been fired. Right. Um, that said, the level of candor here just blew me away, and I'm so surprised that like, I mean, I guess I'm not surprised after what Double Fine has been doing for the past decade because they've been very very clear about their desire to bring transparency to the game development process. But still, like watching this thing. It makes people look bad in a way that most game studios would never, never agree to. I mean, yeah. Tim Schafer, who is a very likable, charming guy, who I think is pretty, pretty well respected and loved by a lot of people. He he does not come off as the best leader of a studio in the, or a project in this documentary. And so, yeah, George, I'm so curious to hear, like, from a PR perspective, would you ever allow something like this to go out? Like, what, what, what? I don't know. I don't even know what to say. Like, is this? See it. Yeah. So I'll set it up a little bit more for the listeners. So, if you case you didn't know, this is a kind of a sequel follow up documentary that right. picks up right after the Broken Age Kickstarter documentary, which was their first time two player productions 
well, sort of embed themselves in Double Fine and show the ups and downs of this game. A much smaller game that definitely had its own ups and downs financially. And yeah. like you saw people cr- pushing themselves to the point of getting sick, but it wasn't as bad as this. And that was a pretty candid, honest look at video game development. So when you go to make a sequel, you kind of, if we pull punches, people are going to call us out right away. And not only that, to your point, Jason, Microsoft purchases them. Oh my God. And Microsoft still let this go through, which is wild to me. So yeah, as a, if, if I was well, a PR market, if I was- Maybe, Microsoft maybe. This yeah, if, I was, if I was James Spafford or mm-hmm. uh, anyone else at Double Fine, it's like, well, we can't pull punches with this one. I mean, at a certain point, we have to not make people look just like, people still need to get, get jobs. People still need to eat and work in this industry. So there's a, maybe there's a limit, but at a certain point, like we gotta put it out. And also for me personally, if I went to work at Double Fine post the first documentary where there's a lot of people here who saw that first documentary mm-hmm. and then went to work at Double Fine, uh, I am in video games because I saw the first Double Fine documentary. Really? And I could see myself in like, oh, I could see myself fit in here. I understand. Yeah. Because again, to my PR marketing people, no offense to us, a lot of the documentaries we put out as marketing material are like, hi, I'm X person and I'm the lead designer on blah, blah, blah game. Uh, welcome to the world, blah, blah, blah. And they tell you their role and what, they're, what they do, but you don't know, okay, how does this artist work among the greater picture of the development? How are yeah. these pipelines connected and all that stuff? And this documentary tells you, okay, this artist works with a team of this many people. They report to this person and then they play that and that shows you it. But to your question, Jason, it's wild that they it got out. Um, I commend the folks at Double Fine and Microsoft for putting it out. And then two player for editing and going oh through my God. so much B-roll. Oh my God. So much footage. Oh my God. Yeah, 5,000 oh hours. It is, it, is my, it is downright stupid that this happened. Like it does not make any sense that something like this happened. And I just, yeah, everyone is so brave everybody who joins double fine agrees to be filmed like this unbelievable yeah. tim schaefer for i'd have to imagine protecting it a little bit even though yeah he has his ups and downs uh in the documentary for his depiction and stuff like that but i think that's kind of the uh, the take takeaway i know it's too early to get to takeaways but george net positive or negative for double fine for releasing this documentary that's a question from the pr oh, marketing that, perspective that, that. I feel like I'm talking too much, but so after the the first Double Fine documentary, yes, the game was hard to make. Yes, like it, like the, the company almost went under at a certain point. But I felt good about video game development. I didn't, I felt inspired. Yeah. I was like, I want to go out there. I can overcome like these small r- bumps in the road. I think that you can overcome them. After this one, it's a little more bittersweet. It's more like, man, I don't know, like. It's a little less cut and dry. I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I, if maybe video games are for me, I would think. It's still great and I'm, I like it a lot and I'm yeah. so glad that this team pushed through, but it's a lot less video games. Yeah, let's do them. Psychonauts 2, was it worth, was it worth right. some of the human moments we went through? Yeah, it's inspired. impressive. Ooh, ooh, okay, great, you're well, inspired. Greg, Greg makes video games, so yeah. <laughs> it's me talking to me like one work at Double Fine. I, 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 think, I guess it's weird because everyone's saying it makes them look so bad. I thought it made, well, I mean, no. obviously they go through some really hard stuff, but I, my impression at the end of it is that like no one came out looking that bad. Even, even like Zach, who was that go at some point, like I liked him a lot. I liked his role a lot. And like, I can understand like, you know, why he was let go and everything. But I saw it as like, these are people who are trying really hard and everyone kind of has their way of solving problems and ways of dealing with what is like it's like what's going on is bigger than any one person like the challenge yeah. they've they've put themselves into is just so ambitious like that's that's the struggle to me is like they've like basically decided to do something that isn't supposed to be done and then everyone's just trying to like deal with the fact that that's just what they have to do now and so what happens from that is like inspiring because at the end they actually made an amazing game right right so like yeah i mean i think what makes that yeah if the ending felt bittersweet possibly probably partially because of the whole like pandemic situation like there was kind of that lack of really big celebration momentum at the end which we felt like finishing chicory at the same time um but uh like the as far as like this journey through the creative yeah this creative journey they went through and and this collaboration they did i think it's great i mean it it looks so much like so much i mean i guess fun is a weird way to put it but like i you know they look like really interesting problems to solve yeah (laughs) that's the weird thing is yeah i mean 
even it's to a much, 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 much lesser degree. But I'd like that God of War documentary that uh, was released for 2018's God of War. It was interesting that it felt like the conclusion that I felt at least was like, man, are games even worth it <laughs> Like to go through all this? And that comes through in Broken Age, that documentary, and then especially in this one. And then with this one, I feel like more than any other documentary I've ever seen, it's just like, man, is running a company worth it? Like it is... How is Tim Schafer smiling and making jokes? It just seems so brutal. And, you know, I want to have a disclaimer out there where it's like, you know, 32 part documentary, it's amazing. We feel like we know these people. Like, it's not fair to talk about these people like they're characters. Like, that's kind of the magic of the editing is to unpack how these people behave and their personalities as it comes through. But it's like, it's still not quite reality. So it's, I want to, you know, get away from being too clear. Like, this person's a villain. This person's a hero. It's like, it's all a little through a, a warped mirror. So it's, and it's just gets to that weird thing of like treating these people like the reality show stars. Like it just so much right. of this documentary. I love it. I am just in awe of everything about it. And at the same time, it's like, it kind of scares me. It kind of freaks me out. Like how brutal and honest and raw it can get at times. It's just like, whew. it's just, I'm mainlining too much humanity right now by watching some of these meetings and I just can't process it. The thing that stood out to me wasn't um, wasn't really the kind of creative conflicts and stuff and personality clashes because that seems pretty normal. And yeah, I mean, I think we've all seen that at some point in over the course of any job. The thing that really stood out to me and made it feel like this is this was so much bleaker than the Double Fine adventure documentary, the first one, is um, that kind of sense that they're on this treadmill that just never stops. Yes, um, I believe there there was this one moment when. They were talking about how this promise of alpha of hitting alpha was had happened two times already, and and uh, also the part where um, I, for, I think I believe it was Carol Shaw, their development director, was saying like this this date is real. We can't right. miss this date. When everybody watching knew that the game wouldn't come out for another <laughs> two years after right. that quote unquote real date. That to me was the thing that really just stood out as like the most like this is why I will never because when you're on something. And you think, okay, two, three years, it's going to be over. Going to get my creative energy out. Going to maybe put in some overtime and then we'll be done. And then that extends to six years of right. development. That just seems like, oh my God. I mean, I was texting. I'm uh, ironically like uh, this uh, rock said he put out a Suicide Squad trailer last night and it's been getting some kind of negative reactions from people. And I'm over there about working on a game for six years, which they've been doing too. And <sighs> It's just, man, games just take too long to make. And that, to me, is the most telling, revealing, like, bleakest part of this documentary is just that it never ends. It's just like, oh, finish light and sit sight. Nope, three more months, six more months. Nope, it's just never going to end. And by the end, you the feel like... the most relatable part. That yeah, topic. man. Yeah. Uh, it feels like, by the end, it feels like Return games. of the King. Like, it feels like you've been on this grueling adventure and it, it just needs to end already. But nope, five more false endings before you actually get to the credits. And credits, it, it's just brutal. Yeah, and it's so, I felt so much for every person in this documentary, but like Carol just trying to be some voice of reason saying, this is the date, everybody. We actually need to hit this, please. But it's like, you know of all the things to budge, maybe it's because we know what happened in real life, but it's like, I think I think that's budgeable. I feel like every relationship they had with the publisher, I didn't feel the tension of the publisher being like, it, it needs to hit this usually is, in my experience. It okay. usually is. Right, so I guess they're in a really unique position here. I think that's what, what's interesting about this documentary as well is like, stressful times with the publisher but it wasn't that long until Starbreeze came along and seems like was really generous with them in a lot of ways and then mad scramble and then they're in another relatively comfy position with Microsoft again so like that being taken care of it allows them to focus so much more on design on personalities on kind of the interpersonal stress and everything there but yeah Tim Schafer had that quote at some point where they're talking about the alpha and then by the end, he says, I like that we've broken the production process so much that we can't even use the language of it anymore <laughs> for talking about like, mm -hmm. this is actually alpha. It is just mind boggling stuff. And there, God, and that's so the like, thing. So it's like, a, it's like emotionally necessary. Like you kind of been pointing out like, like the team was like, like done with the game. So like for them to keep going after that date, yes. I think was hard for them, like mentally, emotionally. And also from a money perspective, like, I mean, I don't know what their agreement is with Microsoft, but you think like. You know, that many people working for that many years costs how much? Mm -hmm. So, like, how much does the game have to make, right? And, like, the longer they go for the more the game has to make for it to, you know, break even or whatever. And, like, you know, after after however long, you know, they push it two extra years, like, that added, you know, however many millions of dollars to their required, mm -hmm. you know, like, that's probably going on, too. 
in San Francisco. Yeah. They live in San Francisco. Also, yeah, they live in San Francisco. Expensive. Like, <laughs> yeah, there's that line too that I thought was really interesting. Where Zach, when things were heating up with Zach a little bit, um, and he just said. Yeah, every time I try and put my foot down and say this is the final say, let's actually make this decision, lock it down, he's like, the worse it gets in the studio, the worse the interpersonal stuff gets. And so just trying to lock things down caused more and more strife to the point that it all eventually fell apart. Um, Jason, what do you think about kind of the... Maybe I'm just seeing this, you know, in the MinMax Discord and stuff, but I'm surprised there's a lot of people out there that are like, Zach got a bad rap. Like, I really want to defend him in this documentary because it's, it's so easy, I think, when we're used to, you know, like the Billy Mitchells of video game documentaries or just documentaries in general. It's like, I feel like they showed a lot of sides of Zach here and it's easy to kind of make that, um, what's the psychological thing? Rorschach test? Um, for sure. like how you want to read into it. But what was your read just on Zach's struggles within the studio? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure that the documentary was able to really capture everything from right. what I've heard. There was some stuff behind the scenes, some screaming matches that maybe weren't caught on film. Um, I also, I think that that some of the, I, I don't know, you could see hints at some of the stuff that happened that wasn't shown when you looked at people's reactions to him leaving. Um, you saw the the whole, that whole episode about Anna's departure. Oh and, my God. Uh, Hypnos, of course, being a longtime fixture at Double Fine and her deciding to leave. Um, there were hints at her departure and why she decided to leave, but uh, but it wasn't it wasn't a hundred percent clear. So I think there was a lot more simmering that hasn't really been shown. But yes, based on what was actually on camera, it seems like kind of a classic story of this guy who came in with one production mindset that he honed over years working at UK and Crystal Dynamics, um, thinking of more of like an auteur. Uh, mindset. I mean, 2K, I believe he worked on Bioshock 2. Mm -hmm. Bioshock is a franchise, of course, known for being very auteur driven for better and very much for worse. Um, and Levine with the first one and Jordan Thomas with the second one. Right. Um, and so he came from that mindset and he came into a place uh, like Double Fine, with, which has its own culture that is very much more freewheeling. Um, everybody gets to have creative input. Um, but maybe that comes at the cost of good production practices and they miss a lot of deadlines, aren't quite as as rigid as as uh, other studios might be. So it's ve two very different um, kind of styles clashing. And we saw the results of that. I guess what what was probably missing from the documentary was more of the personality conflict. But w we got to see why he wasn't necessarily the best fit. And I think the takeaway for a lot of viewers is like oh it was just kind of like a mismatch right when, when you can look i mean if you just track anna's eyes throughout this entire documentary it's like yeah. oh my god just like a blank stare every once in a while it's just like the most heartbreaking expressions in there are just getting worse and worse throughout the whole thing and then it gets and again this is where it gets gross and it feels like you're talking about a, a show or a reality show but like you think about the fact that like with the microsoft acquisition like did Anna miss a huge payday because of Zach, like leaving because of Zach. And then that payday was on the horizon for those old school double finders. Like it just gets so brutal. If you get she went to Google, it. so she got it. I, she got you know, it. Maybe, maybe that's true. I mean, that's an interesting thread is like so many people leaving to go to Stadia throughout here. It's like, okay, a lot of stuff is very time and a place uh, throughout uh -huh. this documentary. Uh -huh. Like, Oh, that's right. That's right. This era. Uh, yeah. Greg, what was your take on, uh, as somebody who's shipped games on just like the struggle within the team uh, to make something happen versus let voices be heard. Yeah. I mean, it like there's, it was interesting to me because I, I feel like the, like double fine makes games that are sort of in the same genre of mine, like that kind of like that story driven kind of heart right. driven kind of stuff. Um, but my games are made with really small teams of like, five people so to see like 50 people try to do what we do i think that was like like what i what i saw is like the frick like a lot of friction coming from basically that because where like i would just like sit at my desk and like decide something i feel like that in in, in double fine is like a 20 person meeting um <laughs> so like a lot of like 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 really complicated like internal like you know cross-discipline conversation and, and compromise that has to happen like that that suddenly becomes like you know each one of those is like a person that's yeah. kind of fighting for their their part of the game um and yeah, like I, I, I commend them for getting through it and, and for actually like, like any other side of making something. Cause yeah, I, I guess when I think about it, like Psychonauts as a game is 
like the whole premise of it is creativity. Like that's like, that's like the first word, right? It's right. gotta be off the wall, but then they also have to like coordinate like 50 people and actually produce the stuff. So they're constantly in this fight of just like, you know, okay, is this crazy enough? Yes, but we can't do it. Can we do this? Yes, but it's not crazy enough. Mm -hmm. And like <laughs> how yeah. they, how they like try to like compromise on those things to make something, I don't know, like that, that, that whole process and the challenge of it is what was exciting to me because again, it's like, that's stuff that I just don't, ever even externalized it's just like decisions i make in my head yeah. so watching them go through it uh and and yeah like and this this is this mismatch of like leadership and and production style totally makes sense to me too that that would happen because yeah i think to make the game they're kind of making it, it had to be the way double fine always makes their stuff like they were never gonna be comfortable making this game unless everyone was involved and there was a lot of cross-discipline stuff and like you know, whatever whatever right so like right um there was i yeah, i I was probably a little slow to the punch. Like I wish I'd caught it sooner, but I, I was feeling there were a lot of moments in the documentary where I was feeling like, um, like, okay, like one example, I thought they should have cut combat from their game, to be honest. Oh, wow. That was something they were, they were talking, they were spending so much time talking about it. And like, I was like, like that was like, I was yelling at the TV, like you just cut combat from your game. Cause like, it doesn't <laughs> do anything. Like it's not a part of Psychonauts. I don't remember. So the boss fights are cool. Mm -hmm. Right. But like they could have had their boss fights in like two years earlier and just not done combat. And they would have saved so much time and effort it just makes sense in that game but that's the kind of thing that was like 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 the fishing mini game right right like i see right. that in the same category it's like this random design stuff that you're putting into your game to try to make it a real game when it's like you're not making a real game like <laughs> but i think coming from that background of maybe the bioshock background and zach's like okay this is an area where it's like what do you ding in the first psychonauts uh i guess combat like we can make that better we can we can shore up that entire front you know but it's right. it's weird to watch a documentary and be rooting for them to be conservative with the design. Like that meeting with Zach and Tim where they're talking about like how many interns to have. And it's like, uh, let's go for three, maybe four. And Tim's like, I think we can get six. It's like, just, just go for three. Just go for three and stop. Stop trying to chew up so much. Like that, I mean, it's the classic problem I'd have to imagine for so many games just trying to understand the scope. And you would think people being around for so long that it's like, why not just go as small as possible and balloon up for there? But I trust that the team has made so many games and know what they're doing. It's just so weird to see it from the outside and maybe just knowing yeah. how long development was going for and just rooting for them to always take the smallest amount every opportunity. Yeah, I think I think that's the problem. Yeah, like making a sequel to such a beloved game too, right? They're yeah. definitely feeling the pressure. Like everything they're doing is like, well, it has to be this thing that was really good, but then also bigger and more expensive, right? <laughs> Yeah. So like they're they're never backing down from like what should have been you know like an an, an easy to pick fight basically. Yeah, yeah. It, it's horrifying. Uh, Jason, what uh, what'd you learn from the game industry about this? Just it's hard <laughs> it's hard to to land a project. It's hard to bring it back down to earth when people are kind of lost in the the dark days of design. Yeah, I don't know that I came into came out of this with any sort of like big revelation. It mm. was more just kind of added to my incremental knowledge that I've learned over the years that I've gained over the years about game development. None of it was super shocking to me just because I've heard the same story a lot of different times. Like yeah. we're a team that is trying to do something that is way too big for the amount of the, the resources that we have in place and their personality conflicts and delays. And uh, potentially crunch, although we never really get an answer as to how much crunch or what that crunch looked like uh, was, which is actually a little frustrating for me after all the setup of like, are we going to crunch? Are we not going to crunch? Uh, never really got an answer. You mean that. like in the in the remote period, in the COVID era? Yeah, well, but right before that, there yeah. was that big meeting oh and my the God. engineer yeah. quit as a result of that. And yeah, I guess it's tough to tell when everyone's working from home how many hours they're working. The, the, the borders of work-life balance kind of blend together. But anyway, um, I think that uh, uh, if I came away from this with, with one thing, it's just that like, like game development is, is truly brutal. And yeah. I don't understand why anyone does it. As much as we like playing the games. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The, the crunch stuff, um, that freaking meeting, like, you know, it's a good documentary when I think they're talking to Key later on. And he's like, oh, my God, did, were you guys, did you film that meeting with Amy Bryce <laughs> talking? And they're like, oh, yeah, we were there. Like, you forget, we were there so many days. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like, especially the way they kind of set it up. Um, and that's the beauty of, you know, releasing this documentary all at once is they can kind of foreshadow stuff. But, like, early on showing the development of Psychonauts 1 and there's that clip of Tim Schafer with the camera as people are, like, sleeping at their desk and he's literally screaming, say you love crunch mode, say it. And then, like, that full journey. Now you see Tim Schafer now of just being like, okay, we're no crunch studio. Yeah, we want to have meals if people want to stay. And then like that push and pull between him and Amy in that meeting 
of him being like, hey, that slippery slope nonsense, like, that's bullshit. Like, we crawled our way up, um, and we think we're doing a real good job, and we need some credit for that. And it's like, but from Amy's yeah. perspective, it's still, you're seeing it. And that's, oh, God. George, what do you think of that meeting? Uh, man, I have a lot to say about, okay, so for that meeting, so there's a few things. So one, the thing that I learned, one of the things I learned was that Amy mentioned when she worked at Gearbox. Yeah. She mentioned, like, it was clear that the programmers were tools for the designers. We don't have, it. it's just a one way when Lissette drew, like, here's the designer, here's the this other person, there's an arrow, it's only pointing this way, mm -hmm. the other studios. Uh, so I thought that was fascinating. I didn't know, I don't, I work with many teams, I've never seen that. So that was really fascinating. But again, like Greg, I work with a lot of small teams that are about five to ten people, and it's right. manageable to everybody, like, have a say. Um, on the slippery slope thing... <laughs> Oh, that would, I get it because it's like you come, it's the weird, I think it's the weird dynamic that all people who work in video games are going to feel now because we have this conversation about crunch over and over. And so every employee is mindful, like, how the f is my boss going to, sorry, I really You're can't fine. swear on this one, You're Ben, fine. how is my boss going to screw me over? How are they going to screw me? And I'm always, always thinking about how are they going to screw me over? And so right. that's what Amy's thinking. Yep. So that's why she's like, hey, guys, I'm starting to feel, uh. And Tim is like, have a little more trust. Come on. Like, why would we do that? And that's the thing that I think everyone's going to deal with where it's like, yes, I, I, from our relationship, I know you're a good person. I know you're a good boss, but mm -hmm. that's always going to be in the back of my mind. I have to look out for myself. And so I'm going to say when I'm starting to feel uncomfortable, please don't be offended. I'm just letting you know. I'm a little scared right here. And right. that was the thing that yeah, I got from that meeting. Yeah, and then Moira even brought up in that meeting where she's like, you know, I, I'm proud of this company because like, if somebody spoke up like that at EA, they'd be kicked, they'd be fired immediately. Like just the fact that we are in a studio that can allow this type of conversation as uncomfortable as it is, like on the day of the Christmas party, it's like, oh my God, or to jump out a window <laughs> with was... that. Oh, it's so Great brutal. Timing. For what it's worth, I'm not 100% sure that's true of EA, or I guess it depends where sure. at EA. EA sure. is a big place, but uh, if you're, uh, I think there's some studios within EA that are plenty open, plenty. Of, yeah. The, I've, I've, I've heard a lot of good things about. That's about nice. EA yeah. I mean, it was it's probably EA in a, in a former era that, that Moira saw and stuff. But also, yeah, that, that, from that meeting, if yeah. I may, real quick, um, we mentioned that Carol was like, hey, this game needs to ship. <laughs> then right and it was rough to hear hear her say that because she was like it's coming then yeah and i found it really fascinating so part of what we do at pop agenda we are peer marketing but we also produce production and play test support and there's been a lot of time a lot of part of our job is we play a build and we go hey this game's not shipping when you think it's going to ship this needs to be this da, 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 da. yeah and i was constantly as a i was just like Guys, I don't know how you're going to make this. That This makes no sense. And so when everyone's nervous about crunch, it's because everyone feels it like there's not a chance that we can make this schedule you have put out for us. And so right. at that point, it's like, we just got bought by Microsoft. Can you please just I know. ask for more time? Like, what What are we What are we doing here? And then we eventually, yeah, Matt Booty's like, yeah, no problem. It's like, oh, that's all it took? Like, right. that was what <laughs> had to budge? <laughs> uh, it's, but yeah, that, that discussion, like, specifically when she's like, when Amy in that meeting was just like, I have heard that you got to have faith lines so many times and I cannot take it. And Tim's like, no one has ever said just have faith. And then like a minute later, Key was sharing his perspective. He's like, you just have to have faith. And it's like, it probably just, the phrase went in his head, but the fact that he said it so quickly after they insisted it never happened. And then yeah. oh, on that key front then, later on when he's in that meeting with, was it Carol and Tim? I'm trying to remember who. Yeah, she's and he's just like, I, I don't know how to do my job right now. Like I... I am absolutely getting fried. These programmers, it is so brutal. And and again, the takeaway from that meeting is they're like, oh, no, no, don't worry. Like Tim and Kara are like, don't worry, it'll be fine, Key. But it's like, I don't know how they're making it any better for him. Like, it's so amazing that he was so open and just to have the takeaway be a place of sympathy, but also just like, no, 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 it'll be okay. And it, it is okay because of people like Key or people like, you know, Jeff just like staying late on the design team to try and make that E3 demo happen. It's just, and Jeff was in sort of a weird spot of just coming from this angle of like, yeah, oh. I think he even said like, there's a lot of things in that meeting I wanted to say that I didn't say because I'm just realizing that to make this E3 demo happen, it's like, it just, I guess it'll just fall on me. Like, I don't want people screaming. I don't want people hurt. I don't want people crunching. So like, I will just pick up the slack quietly and stay late and just get this done so we can ship the demo and therefore 
maybe find a publisher based on the C3 demo. God, it, it, Greg, Another classic oh, workplace tension that I think everybody runs into, no matter your field, is the old timers versus the newcomers. Yes. And the old timers thinking this is how it's always been done and and this is this is the tradition of of Double Fine or whatever company. And this then is what it new, costs to make a good game. Exactly. Yeah. And and I think that's that's some of what I read between the lines of what Jeff was talking about. I don't know. Like, yeah, because they set the bar of quality so high too, right? Yeah. And I guess I feel like those people who are there for longer are, are more invested in it. You know, it's like for someone, like for someone who this is just a job, like it could be, you know, okay, well, there's a couple bugs in it, but like, it's still a good game. It's okay. But for someone who's like, whose whole like, you know, identity is invested in this thing. Yeah. It's like, no, like those two bugs, like we can't leave those in, right? Like <laughs> there's that, there's that difference in investment and, and how much that person I don't know, like is, is willing to sacrifice to, to do it. And right. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like really, it's like, it's actually pretty uncomfortable. <laughs> I think to think about just because there is such an imbalance uh, there and like, it's so it, it gets into such unhealthy stuff, but um, yeah, when, yeah. When, when they get to that point of, you know, showing the demo and they're pointing out things as they're playing it together. And was it, is it Levi that points out like, Oh, there's that seam in the carpet where there's like a pixel gap or something. It's like, okay, this is the level that we cannot, we need to actually deal with this. And that's, you know, the weird push and pull of just, you know, being from the press side and watching this too, is just, I'm watching them sweat over that demo. And it's like, you guys, this thing could be so broken. And I feel like people give the benefit of the doubt, maybe because they're trying to shuffle so many people through that booth that they're worried about people not used to seeing these demos and putting out YouTube videos, talking about Psychonauts 2 is a broken mess. But it's like, I feel like, I always want to tell developers, like, if you are showing it to the right people, like, they understand that this is a product in development. You don't need to sweat this much about these types of demos. And I think that goes into, like... Well, the- I mean, the perspective is it's these are people who have been working on something for yes. uh, four years at this point, and this is their only chance to show it to the public. So right. it's easy to see why they right. would want to be protected. I mean, even if it was, like, a less high-stakes situation, like, it's so hard not to get obsessed with this stuff. Because, yeah, when you're making something and you're, like, putting something out for people to see, it's just, like... You want it to be good, you know, like, <laughs> and if it can be better, you want it to be better. Yeah. Yeah. But that's another takeaway too, is just, you know, being on the press side, it's like, we, we don't know anything. Uh, <laughs> like it is just seeing the stress of this development and then like cutting to like press asking questions. I just, I just want to shake my head and just, you know, uh, <laughs> was that, was that weird for you? Like, did you, did you suddenly have insight into, into your own life or something? I think a little bit. Well, like there's a couple of clips of me like podcasting, but like, oh, it's like, it's like I, shut up. You idiot. It was my overall sense. It was just embarrassing to be in there. Um, but just, you know, it's what it made me think of is like, you know, the acquisition happened so quickly and then going to E3, I remember interviewing, uh, Tim Schaefer with Elise Favis at, at, uh, E3 that year. And like, I was asking a bunch of questions about like, of course, I was like, okay, what about two player productions? Is the documentary safe? Like who owns two player productions? What's going on? And that's, Tim, that's a great question. Well, yeah, sure. But Tim was just like, I don't know, man. I don't know. And now seeing this, it's like, of course I don't know. Like it was coming in so hot. The idea of who's owning every scrap of footage from two player productions. Like they, they are so far from that level of focus at that point. And like, it comes through even just, you know, there's that moment where when they're recording with Elijah Wood, and it's just, you've seen such a brutal, brutal development process and then seeing Elijah Wood seeing like the concept art and stuff. And he's like, God, how magical. You get to work on this stuff every day. And you just see Tim Schafer like, yeah, totally. But like, just <laughs> knowing a little bit more about like what they're going through on the other side, it just, it gives you, I think that's kind of the ultimate victory of this documentary is just like, it makes you so much more sympathetic to so many other games and not in a way where it's like if i'm slapping a review score on it it's gonna nudge it in a way but just basic empathy of understanding it like it's so stupid but i was playing through the new spongebob 3d platformer which is actually pretty good and like playing that while watching this documentary it gave me like so many benefit of the doubt situations like i want to see a documentary about this game because even this game that seems like it's a spongebob platformer whatever it's like you know there were so many similar dynamics on that team and every possible team it's it's I guess the old adage of it's a miracle that any <laughs> game comes out. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I would love to see more documentaries like this about every game, but I, I worry that it would <laughs> it would just make the games industry even more untenable than it actually yeah. is. People have to show their work. I do think Ben. I think it's worth noting here that like uh, you and I coming at this from a press, press perspective and just being awed and marveling at games and the sausage behind the scenes. There, I yeah. mean. we do tend to also over glamorize it. And I think a lot of this stuff is just common in creative processes and really collaborations anywhere. I mean, if like 
if a newsroom has to collaborate on some massive feature that is like eight months in the works and requires a team of a dozen people, you're going to get some meetings like we saw in this show too. Yeah. I mean, if, uh, when you, if you look at the production behind the scenes of a film or like a piece of software, like a lot of this stuff is, is there a lot of common trends there? I think with games, it can feel a lot more brutal and a lot more painful because it's longer than most other productions. And because it's um, kind of that blend of art and technology in a way that, that most things are not most Mm. other creative mediums are not. And I think that's, that's really interesting. But also a lot of this stuff, I mean, I guess another takeaway that I had from this was like, yeah, this is super messy, but like a lot of things are. Um, and it, it felt like it exposed a lot of that messiness that I think uh, a lot of people can relate to, honestly. I think so. Yeah, especially on like the office dynamic side of things. Maybe it's just mm-hmm. being out of the office and not having an office here at MinMax and stuff. But I mean, that is a level of just watching this documentary. It's like it is just office porn in a weird way of like, God, I want to be in there. I want to be talking to people. And like it. I maybe it's an unhealthy spot, but I'm looking at that. And I'm like, I think I can navigate all those situations socially really well like get me in there coach i can do it i can (laughs) i can receive negative criticism i swear i can i swear i can um but that's interesting to think about like comparing it to other creative outlets and we just i don't know if we've ever seen such a thorough documentary on the creation process of anything ever um and that's the part that's wild to think about you know people who do have that perspective i I think of you know like a joseph ferris who's made films that has made games and i think he's even said like oh films are a piece of cake who cares <laughs> compared to the actual production of a game so there's a little insight there but uh greg uh, did you connect with the stress even with the the small teams that you're working with do you feel like that level of stress is is reflected even in a smaller project i don't think i've ever had to go through something um as serious as what they go through in this partially yeah. because of the difference of stakes um and because like uh, there's things about a smaller team that make things easier i mean yeah like i i think that like that that friction that at the heart of this that i think makes it crazy is that they're trying to do like a triple a scope budget like a really really nice production but also something totally off the wall like indie creative feeling yeah and that's where it's like ridiculous because like you know like to to, to succeed at the ladder you, know, you have to do things like throw stuff away and change your ideas and sometimes like the design has to compromise so the story can be good and sometimes the art has the comp you know whatever right right and that's the kind of thing where like like i can decide something like that and all i'm doing is just like shuffling around like my week schedule but when they do that it's like oh well that person's three months just got put in the trash can cool you know yeah. like oh now we like yeah the the, the cinematic team has to rush to relight all the cutscenes because you move this character for this one thing you know like yeah it's it's yeah like those those things don't feel like they they work together so um but I mean, I, I can relate to the, like, the stresses I can relate to are the, like, the pressures of trying to make something really good and that pressure of, like, okay, everyone expects this to be, like, a really creative, interesting thing and they're going to take for granted that this is just going to be fun. Which right. even, like, myself watching this, like, I took for granted when I played Psychonauts that I was like, oh, this is so cool and, oh, their brains and, oh, this brain's cool and this brain's cool <laughs> and I just sort of was like, this is so fun, whatever. Even even though I've, like, made games. But then, like, watching this, you kind of see, like, coming, coming from the other side, like, okay, cool, make a cool brain, make a cool creative brain what do you do huh like what's the brain you make like, <laughs> and and then how do you execute on that crazy idea you just had that's never been done before like it's it's so and i yeah that part i relate to a lot because that yeah. that is that's something that like, you have to deal with like yeah when you're coming and making this stuff greg i think that point uh about the indie mentality is really salient and i think that's something that a lot of companies have struggled with over the years and that we can see very evidently in this double fine documentary is going from a team of 10, 20 people, 5, 10, 20 people, to a team of 60, 100, 200 people, and not actually shifting your mentality of like, oh, everyone can have creative input, we can all sit in a room and hash things out together, like scaling that up is really, really hard, and you risk losing something along the way, because like, if you don't let everyone have creative input, then it's not the same. It doesn't feel like a double fine game anymore, but how is it practical to let everyone have creative input when there's 60 people? Like, is that really possible? And that's when you get into the fundamental tension. And like, we've seen that happen to so many game companies over the years where they have a big success or they have a hit a string of successes at like a lower scale. And then they have to blow up for whatever reason. It's really, really tough. One of the toughest challenges, I think, in game development in general. Yeah, and, and yeah. seeing like those those moments of what Tim and the team playing the game be like, it needs more like 
fun, silly touches. It's like everyone is dying out here trying to make the bare bones skeleton of this thing. It's like, I don't know, I want more like goat jokes and stuff. It's like, okay, it's like that kind of looseness and kind of, I don't know, just creativity. It's so tough to do when everyone also, is scrambling. It's funny that as the viewer who has played Psychonauts 2, to see them like smashing their head against the wall on levels that are not going to make the game. I know. They're going to get thrown out. I know. Like multiple levels just gone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, the bleakness. Like, yeah, like early on when you're seeing the levels they're working on and they're like, yeah, this is it. This is it. And you know, like, oh, that's not making it in the game. Like, I played yeah. the game and that's not in it. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, the, yeah. The hindsight, <laughs> man, getting to watch this all at once. It was an interesting creative choice that they chose to like release it all at once two years after the game came out mm -hmm. instead of trickling. Because with the, the first one, they released it like over time, over the course of the development of the game. And and it's a lot. Uh, it's very different just watching all 32 episodes, binging them all together years afterwards. Um, it's yeah. interesting. It's really interesting. It also gets you that feeling of like, oh, God, COVID is approaching. Oh, my God. Oh, no. I they're know. talking about closing, don't know. <laughs> closing Italy and Denmark. Yep. Oh, my God. It's they're, happening. They're joking yeah, around about COVID. There's a laugh. The yeah. first time it's mentioned. Yeah. Like, oh, of course. Of course. Remember that. Yeah. That, uh, the levels that get cut, uh, like. The James, ugh, this is what's gross. The James storyline, <laughs> they're people, they're people, they're people. <laughs> but the James storyline is just so heartbreaking because there's this general feeling of just, and I, I appreciate that even Zach later on, he said like, it wasn't, it wasn't fair to throw James into this deep end of the pool. Like it's, it's not cool what we did for him coming in, designing his first 3D levels and then to have to design the first Psychonauts 2 level. And just like that, at least from the way it's depicted in the documentary, that energy that he has of just like, just tell me it's good. Tell me it's good so we can move on. And just the amazing thing about a documentary of this length is getting to feel that frustration every time like a topic will come back up just over and over again. It's like, oh, don't drag us back into this. And like, you know, with James in particular, it's like he's so eager just to like get a level approved and make it go out there, please. And it's like, no, 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 we need to do another pass, another pass. And then I think there's even some point where he's like pitching a level and then, oh, there's some, I'm trying to remember what it was. There's some point where like Tim Schafer. The hanging plant thing? Well, the I think it's plant. after, the hanging plants is a big one. There's some point where Tim just like whispers like, no, like you need to let this go, James. Like it's just <laughs> got to stop. And when you've been feeling this process for years of just the brutality, but the hanging plant, again, who the hell knows how this game was actually made? Moment of the, moment of the documentary for me personally, Ooh. just that small, you couldn't write it better. You couldn't write that scene better of the hanging plant where they're like, yeah, we love this plant. It's so good. They made great stuff. And Tim's like, but does it actually make sense? Like if you're hanging oh there and they're like, well, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the number of like really awkward pauses caught in film is like really, really made it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it turns out again, development is a series of slightly uncomfortable meetings with a lot of passive aggressive comments. And when they can like highlight those, like every time that they have a little moment of Zach saying something and then Tim just give them a look, even early on of like, what's this? Like, I think there's just, just like light little moments, but you can feel those stack up. Like at some point, I think Tim Schafer misspeaks and says atrocities and Zach like repeats it. And it's just this little moment of like, huh. Or I think there's a moment where like Zach came in late to a meeting and then Tim's like, oh, look who's late. Everybody's Zach. And then Zach actually said like, why, why would you do that? Like, why, why would you like call me out like this? Just like those little moments going back and forth. I mean that a heartbreaking one is that meeting with Anna where they're mm -hmm. suggesting ideas for the background and she's like, uh, maybe like a waterfall or something. And then Zach's like, okay, should we do a waterfall in the background or should we do something interesting? And it's like, oh my God. It's like these little things you don't realize like the impact that they have. But that's kind of the beauty of the documentary even too is just by the end of it, I'm just screaming like, everyone just be nice to each other. Everyone be really <laughs> delicate and sensitive, please. Because even like Tim Schafer, you get to see him being sensitive in an interesting way where he's in that, meeting that he called and some someone just made a joke i think like tucker his name was about like oh is this a tim meeting or a tim eating because he was like eating that bag of chips and you can tell like oh that that cut to the core of tim schaefer's sense of it, sensibilities and he like made a joke about it of like okay we're not gonna have this level of fat shaming but you can tell like there's still everyone's just a little raw in an office yeah. and it makes you appreciate that in a new way you know yeah it's interesting i was actually i was talking to someone who's in it and in the documentary and working yeah. the game and they were like it's been interesting watching it because they all got to watch like various cuts of it over over the past couple of years or so um it's been interesting watching it because i get to see this 
full like zoomed out perspective of something that I only got my own limited frame of reference on. And right. suddenly like all these tensions that I had with this person where maybe I thought I was the only one or I thought I was being hurt the most by it. Yeah. Uh, oh, other people are feeling that too. And I can now see the dynamics of how this person interacted with that person too. And now I feel a little bit better or maybe someone else feels a little bit worse about it. So it's almost like having this sort of documentary like makes for uh, could, or could potentially make for a healthier work environment yeah. because everybody will understand the whole, the bigger picture a lot more. Because so often both in personal dynamics and in professional dynamics in terms of like what you're actually looking at on the project and what people are working on and such, what decisions have been made, you don't have the full picture and that mm -hmm. communication can be really hard. And so it's really interesting to get that bird's eye view to know that like not everybody who is participating has all the knowledge that we as the viewer yeah. have. And so yeah. those tensions, it makes those tensions even more glaring. Yeah, Stand earlier earlier you said that you you thought that like people release more documentaries like this it would make it less tenable to work in the games industry because people would like have to share their work but i i i, I kind of wish there were more things like it for all these no i that. i yeah to be clear i i would kill for a documentary <laughs> like this about every game right i just right. think that it's like uh it's it's working in the games industry is already tough enough and like people are are finding it difficult enough to stay and to maintain long-term careers in the games industry without also knowing like more and more about how the sausage is made but no i think in general it's a positive thing and i think like yeah. um if there were more documentaries like this more behind the scenes uh looks at these things it would lead to a lot of positive change in industry. and that Everything. ultimately is the goal is to to make healthier work environments yeah, because yeah, yeah, even through this, like we talked about some of the ways that people did stuff on camera that looked really bad. But like my my takeaway still at the end is like I don't think anyone came out of this. I mean, it's their bad moments, but I, I I come out of this like really being inspired by the people in it. Like I see what made them what made them come to those really bad moments, and I see why. And like I really respect the the honesty and transparency to just kind of like the openness to just show all of that. You know, yeah. even the parts that don't look so great. Because I don't know, as a viewer, it's just like it makes me respect everything about the process so much more. It made me excited about Psychonauts too. <laughs> <laughs> it did. I kind of want to go back and replay it. Totally. I, yeah. The I would love to just have like a group of producers from like AAA games watch this and just hear them unpack. I mean, for people that have to stress so much about just the structure of teams, like that is a perspective that I'm so curious about because especially like when Zach is out of the picture, it, you can just feel Andy, the producer, his stress level rising and rising. There's that point where he's just like, I think he just has a little bit of a meltdown. He's like, I can't get people to pay attention and it's freaking me out. Like it is freaking me out right now. And eventually when he's then gone and then you see Naoko step in as the lead producer and you see her, just like her tensions rising. It's like, okay, they are clearly absorbing the brunt of kind of the chaos of this team in a way that Zach was helping to deflect, I think a little bit or just keep things more in line. Uh, yeah, I mean, production, this is not a production minded studio. George, you were talking about this earlier about that kind of yeah. that chain and how and you, how how you found that really interesting. I think like the way that big game studios tend to operate, a lot of them call themselves like a design first studio or an engineering first studio or production first studio or whatever it is. And oftentimes it's based on the founders and their kind of sensibilities. In this case, we have a clear story first and writing first studio because it was founded by Tim Schafer, who is a writer above all else. And one of the fundamental problems, I've actually probed him about this on Triple Click, my podcast, um, on previous interviews or on Kotaka Splitscreen, our previous podcast, um, about like that tension between him having to be studio head and also having to write oh and as a result, never hitting his deadlines with the writing. And we saw, we see a ton of that on Psychonauts 2. And so to your point, Ben, I think that one of the things that's really frustrating as producers is if you are responsible for making sure people hit their deadlines, but the guy not hitting his deadlines is your boss, the right. studio head. Right. What do you do? And that tension, I think, uh, is is, is kind of simmering among a lot of like Andy and, and the other producers. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, you want to talk about tension when Andy left those kind of those awkward jokes from Tim about him being oh Benedict God. Arnold. Benedict right. Arnold. Like, oh my <laughs> God. It's like, Tim, what are you doing? Shut up, man. Shut up. Like, and he, he even made some reference. I think Andy referenced like, oh yeah, I had a meeting with Tim and he's kind of surprised by how, how the feelings were hurt. Like uh, the, how Andy just, it felt like really, shared his full thoughts and they were not glowing overall. Um, that is, I mean, that's the core dilemma. I don't know, theme of the documentary. It's just so fascinating to do of like Tim Schafer being like, okay, I think I'm helping my studio based on the development of broken age. What went wrong there? I'm helping them. If I can 
bring somebody in that almost feels like my boss, somebody who's a little more willing to, to crack the whip and then how that actually filters throughout the entire team. And like, there's that moment early on where Anna even has some joke where she's like, oh, with Zach, does that mean Zach can tell you what to do, Tim? Ha ha ha. And it's like, well, that's kind of the weird <laughs> dilemma. And like, there's those moments too that are so telling where Zach is having a meeting with Tim in Tim's office. And he's like a very logical, great question of just like, okay, I'm wondering like as the project lead, how much do I need to worry about the finances of this game? How much do I need to worry about the budget, the roadmap, all this stuff, just laid out. What do I need to know as a project lead? And at least for the documentary, it seems like Tim kind of like struggles with that of like giving them a clear answer. It's like, okay, that is kind of the core dilemma from previous projects uh, carrying through into this one of his acts to be like, uh, okay, I don't know. My boss is a writer. Uh, God bless him. But that's the weird thing too, is there's so much, he's locked away in the office for so much, worried about the writing of this game. Whereas in the fig pitch for this, it's like, hey, we're bringing back Eric Wolpa, co-writer of Psychonauts 1 uh, from Portal mm, and Valfave to come in and, and write for Psychonauts 2. Not one mention in this documentary about that. Like, Interesting. I, I, was, I didn't even know that was in their pitch. It was yeah, in their pitch. Yeah, me neither. I guess that didn't happen. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Ben, that also happened with the first one. I don't know if you've given this Rob any Gilbert? thought, but with Ron. With Ron Oh. And then he wasn't involved at all. Right, um, right. So, yeah, I don't know. Interesting uh, that these pitches. But, I mean, sometimes with a pitch, like, obviously, figs and Kickstarters, you never really right. get exactly what's delivered because things just change and people drop out and whatever. But, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's definitely definitely interesting. The, yeah, the fig thing. I mean, the history of fig is in itself fascinating. But that idea, like, okay, co-founders, Fergus from Obsidian, Brian Fargo from Exile, Tim Schafer from Dofine. It's like Microsoft just went and said, I'll take you, I'll take you, I'll take you. Um, and so it, it kind of gave me more faith in the acquisition, the idea that, okay, well, Tim Schafer at least knows people who have been acquired and kind of can get the behind the scenes skinny on how hands off they are. And that is one of the most amazing parts of this entire documentary is maybe it's Microsoft bending over backwards to try and prove like we're not going to meddle in the studios that we're buying. But the fact that this documentary is out is miraculous i am blown away by that uh but right. then also just that basic idea of like there's so many moments where it's just like it feels like you know when matt booty visits the studio i think maybe like the second time um and tim shaver's like oh that's where two-player production sits there are a documentary crew that films everything and you get to hear matt booty be like wait for real like what, what are you talking about like they just he seem like amnesia Fortnite, and they're like oh well let's talk about that <laughs> i honestly i think microsoft comes off looking really good in this documentary uh for everything despite yeah. those moments when andy lead producers like what they want me to demo this game on an xbox F you microsoft <laughs> like uh, what he that says that was the most relatable <laughs> it's amazing <laughs> i don't want to give too much but what it's really stressful to get a build running on a console. Right, <laughs> right. So yeah, I thought that was so amazing. But then just seeing like Matt Booty sit down with the entire team and like to address concerns, the fact that he did that first of all and that they allowed that to be filmed is mind boggling. It's, okay, let's get into moonlighting. Let's talk about uh, where we're at with that. And we'll, it's tricky. Amnesia Fortnite makes this tricky. We'll have to see how it evolves moving forward. Yeah. Um, the acquisition stuff, even just seeing... <laughs> Sorry, stop me if I'm rambling, but I'm fascinated by this documentary. But like, even seeing just the process of Microsoft being like, okay, obviously we have our year out meeting where that's really where marketing can wrap their mind around exactly what this game is and how we're going to push it in the final year production. Apparently the like, thing they do, that I, was fascinating. Yeah, I had no okay. idea that was a thing. And then they show that and like show a budget being approved when uh, they have to up the budget for Psychonauts 2 and you just get to hear the reaction from everybody in the Microsoft meeting. They're like, yeah, that's fine. No surprises here. Moving on. It's like, that's all it took to get more money for Microsoft. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, yeah, but any thoughts? They have a lot of money. They do have a lot of money. That is true. Yeah, I think it's uh, to their credit, 100%. I wonder if and when Microsoft pivots away from Xbox Game Pass as a strategy. I wonder if that those meetings and those conversations and the hands off approach will look different because uh most game publishers are not interested in like small quirky stuff they're interested in hitting home runs and they're interested right. in games yeah. that will really make a splash and yeah. double fine right now is working on a bunch of small quirky stuff yeah i think so. tim to me even said something to that effect when they were talking about the the acquisition before it was even microsoft he was saying oh like there's no like the, like times change like someplace that's cool now is gonna suck in yep. like 10 years mm -hmm. but uh, we're just trying to pick a fertile ground to plant ourselves you know so that yeah I guess it, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's true. And yeah, I think I think they're aware of it. I'm, I definitely think about that too. Like, yeah, how how our relationships with these companies evolve and stuff. As a consumer, before I started working in games, when I saw that they got purchased by Microsoft, I was like, 
That solves all their problems. It's going to be smooth sailing from here. Psychonaut right. 2 is going to be good. There's not going to be any problems. <laughs> some of the most tension comes post Microsoft. Yeah, and then you, yeah. you look at like how many episodes are left in the documentary and you're like, whoa. I know. And, and <laughs> I think, again, Microsoft comes off really well in this documentary overall. And, like, you know, I feel like Greg Rice even has some line for how they phrased it. Um, for like, oh, kind of an independent studio, separate studio, I forget how he phrased, like Microsoft's approach to how they're uh, dealing with these studios they're acquiring and stuff. Um, but it's it does feel weird for Microsoft where a lot of their studios have had a lot of production issues. Um, you look at, you know, Initiative 343, and now just seeing like, it, so much of this before Microsoft acquires them, it feels kind of like a prequel to Microsoft production studio stress. And it's like, okay, now they've acquired this other studio that also just sometimes has trouble letting the rubber hit the road here but maybe that's just for big projects you know like they're a lee petty project it seems like it's pretty efficient getting out the door like a headlander and stuff and so james even has that line by the end where he's like maybe the takeaway is just we can't do big games like just double find there's something inherent where it's just i got it's totally that's 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 such a small theme for big games it was like 60 people for a game that should have been made by 200 people by the way limited integration studios thank you thank you thank you which is true i mean from what i've heard from a lot of these places microsoft is like really very very hands-off yeah it's just that with corporations it's always uh, you always have to add a for now to the end of of this of a sentence right but but it's at least for the past few years, it seems like they've been a pretty good bearing company for a lot of these places. Yeah, but it's seeing that bit of insight about like, okay, they announced the acquisition of E3, they bring Tim Schafer out on stage, he makes his jokes, it's all great. Um, there's like, okay, now like, let's get down to the legalese of how this works. And they had 601 points of interest that they need to go through line by line with his acquisition. And Tim even made some reference to like, I talked to other people and they said this is a a real nightmare to wade through because you have to go through all this old paperwork, all the old agreements. And they even had some reference too where they're like, yeah, I mean, we thought we owned Brutal Legend, but actually like having the paperwork to prove that we own Brutal Legend, which Microsoft needs, uh, is tougher than you think. Um, and that's the amazing thing is like they announced this, but then it's like, well, even studio acquisitions when they're announced, huge grain of salt, you know, outside of like, you know, an Activision Microsoft situation, but even something smaller like this, it's like, it was still not a done deal for quite a while because they had to bring so many people in and just go through yeah, line after line. Yeah, well, they signed a letter of intent, which right. is binding. Um, it's just, yeah, you have to go through all the fine tooth, uh, the paperwork and the fine tooth comb stuff and the, all the points. But 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 the letter of intent is binding enough that like you can you can feel comfortable making it public. Okay. Do you understand, Jason? By the way, why are some studios the prices public and some not for for how much they're acquired for? It's really, I mean, it's up to the companies involved. Although with yeah. publicly traded companies, it it has to be public. I mean, right. that's why when Microsoft uh, bought Activision Blizzard, that's all extremely public and has to go through man, many many uh, forms of the SEC. Um, with private companies, it's up to them if they want to announce. Or not, as far as I know. Maybe there's some threshold where they have to right. announce it, but I think it's it's um, they have a lot more discretion. Okay. In that yeah. case, I thought it was really sweet. I think it was like Camden, the audio guy, who's always just a font of wisdom here. When he was like, you know, Tim has always talked a big game about taking care of the employees, but with that acquisition, like, yep, he he talked the talk and he walked the walk. Um, like he's taking care of the old employees, which is nice to see. I thought it was interesting. You would think that they'd have one section of just asking Tim Schafer, like. How does it feel to be rich now? How much money did you get? There's not yeah, really. How much did he get? There's not really any of that. There's a reference later on when the COVID era where you see his house and Tim Schafer makes some reference to like a one bathroom house, by the way, where it seems like he's trying to be like, I'm not a billionaire. I swear I'm not a billionaire. But I'm very curious about it. I, my takeaway from that whole section is like, I feel like Microsoft could have offered them $5 for the studio and they would have gone with it. Like they were in such a rough spot after Starbreeze falling, which was like a big laugh line as they're talking about the legal trouble of Starbreeze, where it's like, how is everyone laughing? You should be scared shitless right now. You don't oh, have a publisher. Hilarious. It is it hilarious. Was, it was that sequence of... <laughs> I remember, actually, this is funny. I was thinking about this as I watched it. Uh, the Game Awards, right before it happened, was yep. 2017 or 2018? Whatever it was. 2018. I think it's 2018. 2018, yeah. it was right after... No, 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 because they were bought in... 20, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you're right. I don't know. But anyway, it was right as the Starbreeze news was coming out. Yep. I remember I was in the bathroom 
the JW where we all go to hang out after the game awards. And I ran into Greg Rice and I was like, Hey man, like the Starbreeze stuff. And he was like, it's fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll all be okay. <laughs> Please Jason Schreier, just let me go stand at the urinal. Please leave me alone. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think bathroom conversations are off the record. That's kind of a, a rule in, in my right. book. We're all, we're all off the record in the, at the John. <laughs> Yeah, I remember um, at E3, I think it was 2017, I did like a group uh, developer interview and it was with Joseph Ferris and Tim Schafer. And in that interview, even Joseph Ferris, who used to work at Starbreeze, was like, oh, so Starbreeze is your publisher? Like, all right, best of luck with that. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, and it's like, oh, but I think, Ben, to your point, though, yeah. to your question, I think they weren't super worried because like they had a lot of a chunk of game and I don't think it's, yeah. I don't think it would be too hard to be like, Hey, we have Psychonauts too. There's a lot of interest. We have a lot of this built already. We just need X amount of money to get it off the finish line. Right. I, I don't think that's super high risk for our other game publishers. So I don't think it would have been too difficult to find another. State yeah. Party. I mean, it's fascinating when they're going through all the publishers early on, they're pitching Psychonauts too, too. Like, all right, we went through 505, Annapurna, Warner brothers. Like, they're just naming all these publishers that pass on Psychonauts 2, except one was bleeped. And I am so curious. Bleeped, yeah. It was like, it's between Starbreeze and Blank. Where it's like, did they ask for approval for those? Or is there a chance that was Microsoft and Microsoft passed and then they didn't want that included? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. But it's just fascinating. Um, yeah, other bits. I mean, just I think it's fascinating to see a team who had been working with their Buddha engine for so long learn Unreal. Like when so much of the game industry is seems like making that shift, just like actually getting more insight that you can possibly imagine of just what that's they, like. They were kind of be ahead of the curve on that one because yeah. Unreal sort of blew up like maybe three years later. Right. Like in a big way. Yeah. At the time, like, yeah, in 2015, whenever that was actually happening, I feel like that was pretty ballsy to do, but it ended up being the right call. Yeah, for sure. Um, also definitely probably added like two years under the project. <laughs> it could be. Yeah, better tools, but somehow it all takes longer. But uh, George, other things that stood out to you you wanted to cover? I'm really curious what the next projects are. Oh that my was God. my biggest thing. I was like, they're already, and maybe that's probably why Carol was so like, we need to get off this game because they're already working on the next two games right. and then they already know what's next after Psychonauts. So it's like, we need to start offloading people onto these next projects for Microsoft. Um, yeah. So I'm, I can't wait to find out. What yeah, I think they are. pretty strongly hinted at one of them. Well, they least. said it was they said it was Derek and Lee's game, but I don't I yeah. don't think I know. Um, well, they also said after that amnesia Fortnite, like seventy percent of people wanted Kiln to continue, right, and Derek right. Rand is uh, leading a game. So, okay. I think that's pretty pretty safe assumption to make. Um, George, I'm curious to hear: Would you ever like recommend to one of the studios you rap and work with to do something like this? To do a behind the scenes like documentary for the like have cameras involved for the entire of a game say yes george please <laughs> I mean, part of me was like i don't know if the audience would would find it as interesting like uh as an audience perspective i'd be like are any of our studios big enough that they would care um it would have to come from like the team like i would have to be like i think you're good like i know the people i work with uh and i know how what their comfort spots are so it would have to be case by case, but as a as a big marketing beat, like oh, people are gonna love this, and they're gonna right. it's gonna result in sales. Like that's not a line one no. can make, right? Like no, it feels very benevolent. It feels like it's like for the health of the industry, but it's yeah, not right. like making your game more popular. Like, and it costs a lot to record all that stuff. Oh my god! You could say it's PR for this come work at our studio, but is that what you feel at the end of Psychonauts too? Well, I, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah, that's Definitely. why I'm asking. Like, I wonder if, yeah. if what like. Do the benefits outweigh the detriments? Yeah. Like, is this benefit? There's a lot of people in that studio who saw Broken Age. Like, mm -hmm. they're like, yep, I want to work at Double Fine. Yeah, I told Greg Rice myself, like, hey, I saw that documentary and I figured I could work in the game. So, <laughs> but I don't know. I don't. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's even that point where at least that even says like, yeah, everyone who comes to Double Fine expecting Utopia, like they're the people that left like they're the people that just you realize that there's there is no such thing as a utopia in the game industry even something that feels so loose and silly like double fine there's just such a brutal cost behind that yeah i mean every job is a job like even right. the best jobs are yeah. still jobs and that's something that that you have to consider but yes in this case it sounds like you you kind of with this documentary specifically, more so than the Broken Age one, I think you're getting a, a, a sense of some of the real like fundamental flaws at the company. Yeah. And yeah, and seeing a lot of people leave as a result of that. Yeah. Uh, Greg, MVP from your perspective in the documentary. Uh, uh, oh, 
man, Emily. <laughs> yes, I, I, Emily is number one in my book too. Like, I, oh. I mean, a lot of people did a lot of like. I, I, I guess I don't really actually feel like it's fair, but I think she was surprising because she came off early on as like the the person they weren't like like expecting to lead much yes. or like to get much out of, and she. It seemed like every time she contributed something, like she always like just changed the conversation and like moved something in a big way. And her ideas are so exciting. And her level was my favorite one. Like when yeah. I it's like when I found out that like 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 five years in she became the leader of it, I was like, Yes, that makes sense, of course. Like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's like it's so sweet too. Like, oh, go ahead. Emily and Gina made during Amnesia Fortnite. I was like, so Man, good. give Emily and Gina uh-huh. something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and like seeing Emily's full story of like her coming in as the intern too, like in the Double Fun Adventure documentary, then just see her like step up in such a big way and just nail like her being invited to that art jam. It's like, oh, my heart is melting. It's so sweet. Like seeing all these old timers really appreciate her. Like, oh, I mean, that art team is just fascinating. And like, just real quick, just the moment, like every time. Some awkward jokes in that meeting too. Also, yes. Also, that it, art. That was, yeah. That was right, right. But again, that's what I love about this documentary is that like, yeah, they're going to make crass jokes at times. Uh, Tim Schafer's going to make stupid fart jokes. Like they'll make, they'll watch walruses masturbating. It's not trying to just like strip everything controversial out of the picture. Um, uh, but no, like seeing um, that certain point when Bagel walked into a meeting, like loose, carefree bagel attitude and it was a kind of a tense meeting it was like this is the documentary in a nutshell of just like bagel I me mean, like hey art i'm here everybody but it's like you do not know what you're walking into it is not the same double find that you are nostalgic about that you and scott campbell are nostalgic about but um mvps uh jason do you want to stand out for you <laughs> i'm not gonna answer come on that. mvp I, no i can't i can't i you mean can't. these are like it's it's tempting to treat these people as characters but you always you, you do have to remember that they're there are people in the story. I mean, you, I think, Ben, are very cognizant of that, of like how they, we're just seeing kind of like these people's lives guy, shaped uh, in the stories. Yeah. The guy who's reviewing the games at beginning and end, what was his name? That guy was my favorite. <laughs> uh, he was really, yeah, he's really cool. Really smart. No, the MVP, the actual MVP is like the folks at Two Player Productions who Absolutely. put this thing together. Because like, yeah. I'm just, the amount of footage, the, the amount of work it took to do this, it's just, I'm awed at it. Um, and also yeah. finding creative ways to like, continue the story in the later years in the COVID everybody working from home, which I admit was not like the most compelling cinematically. It is tough. Um, and it was actually pretty depressing to watch compared to the stuff where they're actually in the office. But, but still, I mean, they pulled off like a masterpiece of this thing. Um, yeah. Maybe something, I don't know if I'm going to watch this as many times as I've watched the first one because it's so much bleaker than the first well, one. The mm-hmm. first one is a lot more fun to go through, but I still just the, an incredible work. I never watched the first one. Oh my God. Oh, you should. You have to. That's going to be like, fascinating. Especially in contrast. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, George, I was thinking about that. The music in the first one was, was much better. I Ooh. think. Life Formed, who did the soundtrack for Tunic. Yeah. And the demo for Tunic. Oh. One of the early demos for Tunic just used the song from the documentary. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, Wait. So funny. the people who made the music for Tunic did the music for the Double Fine Adventure? Life Formed did the music for Double Fine Adventure and Tunic. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. That's that so just, cool. Yeah, I did not know that. really good. He oh, also yeah. did Dust Force, which is like yeah, one of the and best. Dust Force. Right. Oh, right. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. That's a cool game. Oh, of course. Nice. Yeah. I feel like you could. I hope this is analyzed for decades. I feel like if you want to make games like this feels like required viewing for me, uh, Greg feels like you seem, feel the same way. I mean, it's like the most in detail and honest look at it. So I don't know. About yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's helpful for anybody who's interested in, in working in the industry. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And it just feels like, especially with acquisition, it just feels like kind of a last bastion of radical independence is the idea that this documentary was made <laughs> in this way and just dropped out the door. It's, unbelievable that this happened this way so hats off to everybody for for making it happen uh hey uh jason thanks for joining man uh if people love your voice where should they go uh the triple click podcast Hell of yeah. course come come listen to me and kirk hamilton and maddie myers talk about video games and much more sweet uh greg um if people want to play your games learn more about you where should they go I got a website, greg.style, uh, and I'm on Twitter still. Greg, great, Greg great website. Thank you. Uh, Greg, any teasers of what you're working on at this point? I really wish that I could, but I won't. But okay. I think we're going to say something about it this year. I, actually, I think I'll die if I don't say something about it this year. So, okay, uh, okay. That sounds good. closely. Then got the scoop. <laughs> Perfect. Got it. Uh, George, what do you want to plug? <laughs> uh, I'll plug myself. Uh, I'm George. You can follow me at jcruzalvarez26 on Twitter. Um, 
I don't know, to keep a lookout for Venba and another Crab's Treasure, which are games we're working on currently. Oh, yeah, that yeah. I'm really excited for folks to play. I'm really excited for those games. So. Yeah. Right on. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much, everybody, for watching or listening. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. And uh, yeah, please help share Psych Odyssey. If you haven't watched it, but you listen to this, go watch it. For the love of all that's holy, please. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. See ya. Bye. You've seen the headlines. You know that the media landscape is consolidating. Having truly independent games media is more important than ever. MinMax can exist independently as a place about games, friends are getting better, but we need your help. The good news is that it's easy. Just click on that subscribe button or unlock a mountain of benefits by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Thanks so much, everybody.